So, um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, hopefully, yeah, this is working. No, you don't see a slide. Well, the, uh, until we get the slide up there, I, I want to introduce myself. So my name is Dominic Bösel. I'm uh, actually I have, I have several roles. So today, mostly, I think I'm here for KUKA. So I, I'm vice president consumer robotics. So I build bring robots to your homes, hopefully. Uh, the second one is my hobby. I run the Robotics and AI Governance Foundation. I think we need robotic and AI governance, so a governance framework for that. And the third one is I chair the Tech Ethics Initiative in IEEE. So, um, oh, thank you very much. So I, I, I accept the challenge of 15 minutes. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, we, uh, uh, we try to, to be helped by technology. All good. So let me let me start a bit with looking in the future, um, and because that is actually what my job at KUKA is, I have to predict the future and and see how the world is going to change. And the funny thing is, especially with technology, there always have been misconceptions. So in the 1830s, people believed that people would die from the high speeds in a train, 30 kilometers an hour, actually. A little bit later, they thought that radio and 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 uh, X-ray was just a party trick. Um, Oh, okay, ah, perfect. No, not yet. It must be a connection somewhere. Ah, no, it works. So everything that can be invented has to be, uh, is already invented. Never will a rocket leave the planet. At least that's what they believed in the 1930s. And you also know that one, there is never going to be a market for more than five desktop computers. And I just don't know why we're always dropping here. Okay, well, let's do it as follows. I just proceeded with a speech and not with a presentation. No issues on that. Um, so, basically, the point that I wanted to make is there always has been misconception of, uh, about predicting the innovation in technology. And um, here, I, I try to refer to the slides while you see them. Um, so, uh, 140 <laughs> kilobyte of memory, nobody needs more. Um, so, oh, that's really... Now this is not doing anything anymore. Okay, good. Well, you know what, then, then we just cut that. Um, I just tried to find a nice slide and then we, we stay at that. So let, let's stay at that slide. So what I wanted to say is, the problem is you cannot predict the future. And this leads us to the core problem of innovation, especially technical innovation. Because if you cannot predict what is going to happen, you have to try to approach how the world is going to, uh, to develop. And Fabio was already doing that. So what we can say about the future is how the world is on a large scale going to be shaped in the future. That we can approach through megatrends. What is a megatrend? Well, actually a megatrend is something that was, the notion was invented by the John Nasbitt in 1982. John Nasbitt uh, was writing a great book. You can still buy it today. He was talking in 1982 about the time of today, about 2010, 2015. And the great thing is he was actually pretty precise. How did he do it? Well, actually he came up with the idea that you could talk about trends that are A, global in scale, something that applies to the whole world, and B, something that is as big as that it will bug us for 25 years. And Fabio was already touching on some of those. For example, uh, resource scarcity, and not just water. So there are pessimistic studies that claim that in the next 20 years we might be running out of copper and in the next 30 years we might be running out of helium. And this is a very interesting point because helium cannot be synthesized. It's one of the most important gases in chip industry. So if we want, if we one day run out of it, we can only resupply it if we solve the problem of cold fusion. And you know, that's always another 20 years out. Um, the other interesting things that we can say about the future is, for example, we know that in the next 30 years, more than 43% of the human population will be living in metropolitan areas or in cities. Now you might say, okay, good, that's a low-brainer, I knew that before. But interestingly, this is one big driver for Industry 4.0 in automation. Because what happens then? Well, look at what the market is doing today. For example, Amazon is, pr is promising you that you can have same-day delivery within 45 minutes. What does that mean? I don't know about Brussels, but I know about Munich and London and Paris and, and, and New York. 
to get from one end of the city to the other, you need more than 45 minutes. You need three hours, four hours. But if you want to have something delivered in 45 minutes, no matter where you live in that metropolitan area, then actually you need prediction. So you have to know what people are ordering even before they order it. And you need decentralized warehousing. You need warehousing and storage everywhere in that city and not just how we do it today. Build a big storage system somewhere on the outskirts of a city. So this is uh, something that is going to change. The other thing is another mega trend is the how we see diversity. So the gender roles are more or less dissolving, which is a good thing to my personal opinion, but this will also completely alter how we see markets in the future. You can no longer market products to, I don't know, young successful men age 35 or young girls age 14 or, or, or whatever. No, you will have to completely rethink your marketing and your product orientation. Another important one, especially for the Germans, uh, car manufacturing, that's something that is always bugging the German industry, uh, or many, a lot of the German industry. Um, mobility. How is mobility going to change? Well, basically what is going to happen is that um, there are studies that claim that 53% of the young people in those metropolitan areas actually, for example, in Mexico City, they can afford a car, will no longer make a driver's license. So they say, I don't want to own a car, I just want to use or consume mobility, but I'm not going to own a car because A, it's too expensive, B, I don't find a parking, and C, I'm in the traffic jam all the time anyways. So um, on the other hand, in the same target group, in Germany, 75% of the young people will still buy a car, even if they just put it in front of their house to annoy their neighbor. And th this shows that we will have completely different markets in mobility, for example. There will be a mass market for, for non-individualized mobility, more or less like a, like a mobile phone bill today. I might get a service bill for mobility at the end of the month. So maybe I use an electric bicycle or a, an autonomous car or a train or a plane or whatever gets me here. Um, and then there will be a market for highly individualized um, mobility that has that comes at the premium price and the car suppliers and car manufacturers have to address both so you will need lot size one production for premium models and you need a high output uh, manufacturing maybe also relying on cradle to cradle or re uh, close resource loops which means we no longer have to just think about how to assemble a car but maybe one day we also have to think about how to disassemble a car automatically and this is a completely new challenge because everything we did for the last or have been doing for the last, well, actually since Ford started building cars is how to bolt and glue and weld them together as fast as possible, but never how to disassemble them or how to save resources. So just tapping into those megatrends a bit. So I have been talking a lot now about those megatrends, but what do you think is the most important one? Actually demographic change and even for, for the manufacturing industry, why is that? Well, because in 2020, so in two years of time, more than half of the German population will be more than 50 years old. And now you could say this is a nice first world problem, but uh, actually Volkswagen issued some numbers that globally in 2030, they will be missing about 15% of their workforce. So in, in 2030, from 200,000 employees, 30,000 will have retired and they globally Globally, they are no longer going to find those on the labor market, so they run into a global labor shortage. This is actually supported by numbers from the, from the United Nations and the OECD, so that by 2040, 2050, we're really facing this global labor shortage of skilled labor. And so the question is no longer, how do we have to automate? The question is, how do we have to automate? And those are exactly the challenges that Fabio also tapped upon, which is, how do we handle the, so, so if somebody tells you robotics will not make you lose any jobs, that is not true. But the question is not, you're not destroying those jobs, you're shifting those jobs. Which is, by the way, also something that now the unions are currently discussing heavily, because it's no longer about how should we, should we ban robotics or should we, I don't know, uh, not allow to, to robots to perform certain tasks or something. No, it's really about how do we deal with those people that maybe 
today might have to face a shifting job profile. So how do we requalify? How do we qualify in the future? How do we do education? And how should the educational system of the future look like? And honestly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking much about those things and I have been for some years, but now I have a four month year old. Oh no, actually today is five month old. My son is five month old today. And um, the, the interesting thing is I'm talking about his future. I'm talking about that I, so my grandfather was working with one company for his life. I have already been working with four companies in my life. And he one day might be working with 20 companies in his life. So lifelong learning, the ability to be skilled and reskilled and retrained over your job life, that will be one, one crucial skill. So getting into robotics a bit, so um, what is the, the important part of the future of robotics? Well, I believe that robotics is actually elaborating, and, and I'm just checking the time a bit on the, on the side here. Oh, thank you, perfect. That's what, okay. Um, so I believe that robotics is actually evolving in four phases. We like to call those the four robotic revolutions. The first one has already happened. That was what we have been doing for the last 40, 50 years. How to weld and bolt and glue a car together as fast as possible. Those were giant industrial robots that you can get from maybe KUKA, Komao, ABB, Fanuk, whatever is out there. And, and those machines live in a cage. It's like a robot zoo. You have people separated from machines. They're fast. They're potentially dangerous. And they can manufacture a body and weight of a car in less than 60 seconds. The interesting part is when Ford started building a car, he needed 91 minutes for a car, which was completely unprecedented. And now we build a body in white in less than 60 seconds. This is what happened in the last 100 years. It's still not service robotics because those are robots that you cannot touch, that you cannot interact with. So the second robotic revolution is actually that you have robots that are sensitive and safe. We uncaged the robot and now we have robots that you can directly work with. For me, driving consumer robotics, that's also just partially sexy because um, the, those robots are still bolted to the table or to the floor and I have to get to the machine. What I want is actually Jetson's Rosie. I want a robot that comes to me and helps me perform tasks where I am. So I'm talking about service robotics, I'm talking about consumer robotics. That means the third revolution is when those systems become mobile, but they're still not smart. And thank you, Fabio, for showing the nice video of the DARPA challenge before the robots tumbling over. Everything that you see in robotics today is still coded line by line by line. There is no robot out there that I could tell and say, mm, actually, I don't, like, uh, I don't like a water right now. Can you get me a soft drink or a coffee? And it drives out of the door, opens the door, searches a coffee, and brings me the coffee here. That simply does not exist. And you all know that. Try to take out your mobile phone now and try to order a pizza through voice control into this very room. Then you put your phone back into your pocket and you're happy that never, nobody ever combined that with a robot yet. So the interesting part though is getting back to the mobile phone that we have some certain technological triggers. So the fourth revolution will be when those robotic systems become smart and when they start understanding what you want and when they start to learn. The technological trigger for that is computational power. You carry now in your pocket more computational power than they used for the whole Apollo 11 moon mission. They landed with less computing capacity than what with, you, uh, with what you carry in your pocket. That enables a lot of showcases, but it leads to one of the problems. And this is what you usually refer to as the Hollywood effect. And now I'm getting a bit into the robotic governance idea. We're tampering with some very disruptive technologies. I don't believe that Bill Gates was right because Bill Gates in 2009 said a robot in every home by 2025. I don't, that, I, I don't think that's true, simply because it might be too expensive, not everybody wants one, and so on. But I might imagine that it could happen in 2040, maybe. Anyways, what I do know is that my son Philip and his kids are growing up as the first robotic natives. They will be the first generation R. They will be surrounded by automation technology in all different forms. This will come through software and it will come through hardware. So expert systems, smart assistants, maybe robot furniture, self-driving cars. The, uh, the degree of automation and autonomy 
are all around us is getting bigger and bigger. So robotics and automation and AI will permeate all areas of the living realm, but there will be no threat to that generation. Like the internet today, nobody is any more afraid of the internet. Well, maybe we should be, but it's a different discussion. Um, but nobody really is. People, well, you have to look at it like this. In Germany, there was a census in 1982. People were demonstrating in the streets because they had to give you those informations, their name, how many people were living in their household, the address, and their birth date. That is less that you put on a postcard for a television, uh, television competition where you can win, I don't know, a mixer or something. So we give away our in, in, uh, information freely, and that generation will act with automation and those technologies in the same way. This means we have to take responsibility. I'm not believing in what Elon Musk, Bill Gates, or the unfortunately say, uh, currently passed away Stephen Hawking have been saying that robotics and AI are going to destroy humanity. I don't believe that. But something very dangerous is currently about to happen, and so I'm very thankful to Maddie that she rose the point many, many months and years ago, actually. Um, because what we're having is we have the Hollywood effect. People are aware of robotics and AI. Last year, 11 movies in Hollywood have been dealing with robotics and artificial intelligence. It starts very cute at Baymax, you know, this cuddly robot helping people, more in my shape. Um, and it goes into like Avengers Age of Ultron, hack and slash and slay action movie, to smarter movies like Ex Machina, Her, Lucy, whatever. So the interesting thing is people are aware of robotics and AI, but they have a misconception there. Because they believe that either Jetson's Rosie, the robot housekeeper, and the, so the, 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 the robot butler, or the Terminator are just two years out. And the video from the DARPA challenge showed you that this is, this is actually not true. We have tumbling robots and technology is not there yet. But unlike, unlike the internet, we now still have time. The internet just happened. Because nobody could imagine that now people can only live if they have cat videos on their phone when they're in the sub subway. So, and, but the, the thing is, these technologies will be equally disruptive or maybe even more disruptive. So we have the responsibility to shape them. And I think that has to happen on five levels. Ethical, moral, sociocultural, sociopolitical, socioeconomic, and also juridical. And we have representative from all those areas here. So what do I want to do with robotic governance? And this is what I, with, with what I want to close. So the Robotic and AI Governance Foundation, which is, by the way, I have to say this disclaimer, completely uh, not connected with KUKA, that's more my expensive hobby, is looking into, we need governance frameworks for that. So we have to start this educated discourse. We have to inform people in the streets about this innovation so that they understand where we are with those technologies. The second thing is, I believe in a robot manifesto. So, and forgive me, I'm a computer scientist, it has to be a prime number. So the 7, 11, 13 rules of robotics, because Asimov doesn't hold yet. Asimov says a robot may not harm a person, but that only holds if the robot can decide if it wants to harm a person. Before that, we have to define what we want, what we don't want, what we accept in robotics, and that's what we're currently trying to do. And so I'm happy that there is this robotics charter coming up and all that. I think we have to involve all the stakeholders and really consolidate on this. So, closing with that, I hope more or less in time. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for the slides. I hope I could, could still give you some, some interesting ideas. I promise you there wasn't one, anything else important on the slides apart from some nice pictures and my contact info, but we also find me on the internet. Thank you very much.